Welcome to the first edition of the Customers First Coalition Electric Wire podcast. I'm Kristen Jilks. I will be your host for this podcast series. We are starting this podcast out with an energy innovation series. We will be doing a series of six podcast episodes. First, I want to give you a little bit more background on who we are. The Customers First Coalition was founded to preserve Wisconsin's affordable and reliable electricity over 20 years ago. We're here to promote the benefits of the regulatory model and help find consensus on issues like renewable energy and electric vehicles. I want to thank the members of the Customers First Coalition for sponsoring this podcast series. Our members are the Citizens Utility Board of Wisconsin, the Dairyland Power Cooperative, the IBEW 2150, Madison Gas and Electric, the Municipal Electric Utilities of Wisconsin, Renew Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Electric Cooperative Association, and WPPI Energy. We're starting a podcast series because as many of you know, we typically hold two events a year. We had started out holding an annual power breakfast, and then a few years ago, we started holding two events a year, sometimes a power breakfast, sometimes a power lunch. And what I started sensing is a little bit of conference fatigue. Everyone loves the educational aspect of these events, but it gets hard in the course of a day with so many meetings going on to make it over for a full power lunch or power breakfast. And so we thought we would bring this podcast series to you. We want it to be educational. We want it to inspire you. Um, But we also wanted to make it convenient. So if you're listening at your desk or listening on your way to work, it just gives you a little bit more time in the day. Over the course of this energy innovation series, we plan to cover the topics of solar, electric vehicles, energy storage, microgrids, wind, and smart buildings. All leading up to our power lunch at the end of April, the power lunch will be on April 29th. The Power Lunch is called Building Toward Net Zero Carbon, and registration is actually open now, so you can go to the show notes for a link to register or visit our website. So for the first episode here in this Energy Innovation Series, we're going to focus on solar, and we wanted to get a set of diverse viewpoints Um, I didn't think it would be right to just have one interview on solar and assume that you're getting everything you need to know about where we're at. So we have three separate interviews within this podcast. Again, look to the show notes to find out where the particular interviews start. So if you're interested in Representative Kuglich's interview, you can just go to that one pretty easily. Our guests are all pretty awesome, though. I would say when I listen back, I I really love this episode and all the interviews. uh, I really learned something from. So please, please feel free to listen uh, to the whole thing here. We have Heather Allen from Renew Wisconsin first, sort of setting us up with the lay of the land. Jeff Ripp from Alliant Energy talking about their massive investment in solar and Representative Kuglich. Uh, who is chairman of the Assembly Energy and Utilities Committee, talking about some legislation he's working on dealing with solar and wind workforce training. And I am extremely happy to be joined by my co-host today, Matt Spencer of Madison Gas and Electric. Thanks for having me, Kristen. Thank you for joining me, Matt. I'm very excited. Matt's been on the job at Madison Gas and Electric as Director of Government Affairs. Did I get that right? Yes, that is. I'm. Uh, I started in November. Great. So it's been a, a fun-filled three months, and uh, just diving in headfirst to all these issues. So excited to have you um, in the industry, Matt. But this is not the first experience you've had in the industry. What other jobs have you held? So prior to working at Madison Gas and Electric, I spent some time at the commission, uh, the Public Service Commission, and I spent about eight years up at the Capitol, uh, about five of which I clerked the Energy and Utilities Committee. So I've uh, got to know Representative Kuglich quite well, and I've gotten to know the industry um, from inside the building, um, but it's now nice to be working for a company like Madison Gas and Electric. So what do you like about Madison Gas and Electric? Well, with our service territory being so small, we're able to communicate uh, differently than the other utilities in the state. Mm -hmm. 
We, were, we have 153,000 customers in Dane County, and we really are the local energy company for the citizens of, of Dane County. And we're able to communicate and create a dialogue, figuring out what our customers actually want and what they need. And I feel like because of that, we're on you know the cutting edge of technology with EVs, solar, wind. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really great company to work for. So what's the status of solar power at Madison Gas and Electric? So I feel like our company is on the cutting edge of renewables. Uh, Since we announced our 2030 framework, which um, in 2015, we have expanded our renewable capacity by 600%. That's a lot. It's a lot, yeah. Uh, We have a new shared solar program um, that began in 2017, and it's expanding again this this year, by the end of this year. but it's, it's, a, it's a way for our customers to buy locally generated renewable energy, solar energy. Um, I actually saw that in the Willie Street Co-op Reader. Did you? I saw the advertisement for it, yes. I mean, we do a lot of outreach um, on projects like this because it's, a, I mean, it's, a, it's an example of, you know, talking with, our, talking with our customers and realizing that these folks want to buy locally gener- generated renewable energy. So if we can create a program where that we can provide that, um, you know, safely and reliably, we're going to do everything we can to do that. Um, and then we, we jointly own um, a few large uh, solar facilities in Two Creeks. My, um, Two Creeks, my wife's from Two Creeks, so I have a tendency of saying Two Creeks now. And Love it. yeah, and then also in Iowa County. So 150 megawatts of solar energy hopefully by the end of 2021, if the second phase of Badger Hollow gets approved uh, by the Public Service Commission. I mean, it's all really exciting. And um, we're, we have a goal of t- uh, by 2050 of net zero carbon. And one of the ways of doing that and decarbonizing our grid is renewable energy. Absolutely. And we're going to do everything we can to do that. As long as we can do so in a safe and reliable manner for our customers and an affordable, we're going to do everything we can to bring these new technologies, whether it's wind, we have a new, we have a, the Saratoga wind farm, um, anything we can to bring renewables into the homes of our customers. Thanks, Matt. So one of the questions we're going to ask all of our interviewees in this energy innovation series is, do you have any bright ideas for the energy industry? What are your bright ideas? What would you do if you were king for a day? I don't want to. I don't want to go over the top with this, but with technologies like battery storage and, you know, and expanding solar facilities and wind generating systems, we need to work within the regulatory model and the PSC to make sure that these projects are being done and approved in a timely manner. The 2050 goal is an ambitious goal, but we need to work with our regulators to make sure that things aren't getting held up and we're able to move forward in a manner that is appropriate and reliable for our customers. Absolutely. And that, you know, I was thinking of a bright idea I had um, on this topic. And I think my bright idea would be Let's talk about the benefits for customers. There's benefits for customers coming from these solar projects. There's benefits for all customers when we see EV adoption increase. Mm -hmm. Um, The topic of our next podcast will be EVs, and I think there's a lot more we can discuss about benefits for customers, uh, particularly in that area. But solar and wind and, and all of these new technologies Let's, let's make sure we keep talking about what the benefits are for all customers. And when you look at technology of how it's changed, I mean, I, when I clerked the Energy and Utilities Committee four or five years ago, none of this was happening. And just how much has changed in the last five years to where it's we so are true. right now. I mean, 600% increase in renewable capacity for a company like us is huge, not only for our company, but for our customers. Um, and... You know, we, we're taking on EVs. Um, it's, it's exciting. It's an exciting company to work for. Uh, I think our customers are happy with us. At least I hope so. And um, I look forward to seeing what new innovations are going to be ahead of us in the next five to ten years.
It really is changing at a rapid pace. Well, thank you, Matt. Thanks for being my co-host. I'm glad you're going to be with me for these upcoming interviews. We're going to start out with an interview of Heather Allen of Renew Wisconsin, who will give us a lay of the land on solar energy in Wisconsin right now. We are joined first today by Heather Allen, who is a program manager at Renew Wisconsin. Heather, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us more about what you do as a program manager. Um, thank you for having me. This is really ex- I'm excited you're starting a podcast as a lover of podcasts. I think this is great. Um, yeah, what I do at Renew is um, I do a, a, sort of a jack of all trades. I do a lot of different things. But one of the main things I do is supporting um, grassroots education and outreach about large-scale wind and solar farms. So just last night, I was up in um, Pierce County at a town hall meeting in the town of Gilman because they are debating and exploring a 74-megawatt solar farm. So I go to these meetings. I explain the economic benefits of renewable energy. I work with local elected officials, give them all the materials and information and the studies that we can find um, to answer their questions. And also, um, one thing we've been doing as Renew, as Renew Wisconsin, is helping translate, you know, what other communities in Wisconsin are doing so that so that people don't feel like they're recreating the wheel when they start a planning process for solar or wind farm. Because it, it can be daunting. There's not not a lot of guidance about how to how to process these applications. Mm-hmm. So how did you get involved in this space? What did you do before Renew? So immediately before Renew, I was the city council legislative analyst here for the city of Madison. So I did policy analysis for six years. And before that, I worked for NOAA and NRDC out in Washington, D.C. doing international environmental policy. But what brought me to renewable energy was I put solar on my home through the Madison Group Buy that Renew administers about four years ago. And then... I live on a busy, Mm -hmm. busy pedestrian walkway and I would see people walking by and looking at my house and pointing at my house and talking to each other. And I was like, people like talking about renewable energy. I like talking about renewable energy. So I started a podcast actually. And, um, though it was called the Wisconsin energy broadcast and that podcast got me so excited about renewable energy that I started looking for jobs in this field. That's so cool. So how can people (laughs) find your podcast? You can just, you know, you can just look on iTunes or Spotify and Google Wisconsin Energy Broadcast and there it is. And we can have like crossover episodes maybe. I'm so excited. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Well, thank you for joining us for our first podcast. Absolutely. So we are hoping to get from you sort of a lay of the land of solar in Wisconsin. Where have we been? Where are we now? And what do you see coming in the future? Sure. Well, I think, I mean, the big story is we are ramping up at an exponential scale. So as of, um, you know, beginning of this year, we had about 130 megawatts of solar operational in the whole entire state of Wisconsin. That's well, much under 1% of the total electric generation in Wisconsin. And it took us 30, 40 years since solar was, you know, commercially available to get that far, 130 megawatts. But in the MISO queue, that's the queue where developers put their projects that they want to develop in the future, we have around 6,000 megawatts of solar proposed for the state of Wisconsin. So that means, you know, it took us 30, 40 years to get to 130 megawatts. But if, but just in 2019, another, I want to say 500 to 700 megawatts of solar were approved. Those haven't been fully constructed and operational yet. But then we have another several thousand waiting to be developed and permitted and approved. So ramping up. (laughs) And so when I say 130 megawatts, that's every house that has solar on it, every church, every commercial business, and every small scale solar farm, because most of what's been developed in Wisconsin to date is uh, solar farms under 10 megawatts. And what do you think is driving it now? Is it? Oh, it's the cost. Yeah, it's absolutely the cost. So costs have dropped dramatically. Solar is down 88% in the last 10 years, and that means that solar on a large scale is now less than half of the cost of building a new coal-fired power plant. And so it's extremely cost competitive, and um, it's extremely timely because the tax credits, which make these projects even more cost-effective, both you know for private homes and for large-scale projects, 
um, those are ramping down and will eventually disappear for, for residences. Are there any efforts to keep those going? Yeah, yeah, actually, um, there certainly are. The Solar Energy Industry Association um, in Washington has been lobbying for extending those tax credits. Um, they were unsuccessful in getting that done in 2019, but I think they'll try again, but we'll see. Um, I think they're more optimistic about um, the credits for battery storage mm -hmm. playing a strong role in the marketplace going forward. So how do you see solar and storage working together? Well, um, as the cost of storage have come down, developers are turning more to incorporating storage into their large scale renewable projects. So there is a proposal um, which the application will be released in, a, in about a month or two um, for a project called Paris Solar in Kenosha County. It's a 200 megawatt solar project, but then accompanying that would be a 50 megawatt storage component to help smooth out some of the electric generation and give the um, whoever's owning the project control over how that electricity, you know, moves and is stored. So that would be one of the biggest battery projects in the Midwest, actually, if that if that becomes one of the approved parts of the project. So it's exciting. I mean, it's definitely happening. And more and more private homeowners and businesses are installing storage. Um, Northland, Northwind Solar up in Stevens Point has become um, an installer of Tesla battery walls. And they've, you know, they've already done like a dozen projects on homes in that area. And they got a lot of calls after there was a blackout in August of 2019. They got a lot of calls about putting batteries in so that they people could mm -hmm. keep running their houses in a in a blackout. So your boots on the ground grassroots for projects, util, um, is it all utility scale that you? I, I, I support my colleagues who mm -hmm. work on yeah. um, distributed generation okay. as well. Um, so, you know, MG&E, we have, we have uh, we're going to own 150 megawatts, potentially, hopefully, by the time Badger Howell Phase right. 2 comes into. So what are you hearing from... Um, residents, customers, when you're doing these trips across the state, uh, I'm assuming it's both good and bad, but can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, especially when it comes to utility scale, it's really interesting who comes out um, in support or opposition for these projects. We see a lot of support. Um, we've seen a lot of teachers and educators and students, especially. Um, we've seen people who are members of environmental organizations come out and talk about the environmental benefits. But we've also seen um, people who are very excited about the economic benefits of large-scale wind and solar because the revenue formula that brings, uh, brings income back into the community for communities that are hosting large-scale wind and solar projects is very generous. So it's $4,000 per megawatt per year to the county and the town, and, and that is split between the two of them. This can bring millions of dollars yeah. into a community. So we saw this particularly in Richland County, which um, had a solar farm, 50 megawatts, developed by Trade um, Trade Wind Energy, now known as Savion. And, and the conversations were critical because that community had seen some difficult economic times and they'd lost their school. And they were really looking at this new solar farm as an opportunity to reinvest in the community to have some drought resistant economic continuity over the next 25 30 years for the life of the project and um and also they saw it as a potential education opportunity so that something that i thought was interesting that that conversation generated in richland county was the idea that maybe this solar farm could have an education kiosk associated with mm -hmm. it to allow young people to and other and everyone to get a sense of how does the solar farm work and learn about the jobs associated with solar construction and operating those plants. So, um, so there's a lot of excitement and to answer the other part of your question, there are, a lot, there are a lot of folks who are not sure what to think about a large scale solar or wind farm. Um, folks want to make sure that it's safe, you know, that it's not going to impact anyone's health negatively. Mm -hmm. Um, in the case of wind, there are less concerns about land use because you can develop a, land, a wind farm and still farm right around it. But in the case of solar, you are taking land and you're going to you're going to do solar on it. You won't be able to farm traditional farming under those solar panels, but you can do things like grow pollinator friendly plantings. Um, you can create nice native habitat mm -hmm. that 
enriches the soil and, and prevents runoff of phosphorus and other nutrients. So there's multiple benefits, but but that has to be communicated to the public mm-hmm. because folks folks here in Wisconsin, they care about their land, they value agriculture, they value working the land and the culture of all of that. And so we have to be really sensitive about those needs and those values and make sure people understand that solar is compatible with agricultural communities and can be very beneficial to them. What about the people who are concerned about the way a solar farm looks? What do you what do you tell them? I've never been to a utility scale solar project, so I'm just interested. What what can people expect? Sure. Um, well, they're arranged, um, you know, just in rows of solar panels, usually on tracking systems. So there's steel posts in the ground, and then the solar panels sit on top of the steel posts, and they rotate throughout the day to track the sun and get the most um, energy. And between them could be rows of beautiful native plants. Um, and then it does have the project does have to be surrounded by a fence, but they can be surrounded by deer fencing, which is still very compatible with the look in Wisconsin to agricultural communities. I think they're beautiful personally. I think they say that we're generating clean electricity, we're transitioning to a new clean energy economy. I love them. I love looking at them, but that's personal. Not everyone lo- likes to look at them. So in some cases, Developers um, working with neighboring landowners have agreed to um, put in certain types of screening vegetation so that you wouldn't always be looking at solar panels. Maybe you're looking sure. at at trees instead. Or I've I've um, there's other um, screening options. So it's that that is I really think it's a matter of taste. It depends how you feel about what they're doing. Really. Perfect. So is. What's Wisconsin's solar profile look like? Is this a good environment to install solar in? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. To give you a sense of comparison, Germany has about 7% of its electricity is generated from solar power, but they have significantly less sunshine than we do. And we have currently less than 1% of our electric generation is um, in solar. So we have a ways to go before we even meet the bar that sort of Germany has set with their the way they're harnessing the sun. Tell us more about this meeting you were at last night. Perfect. Yeah, it was it was really interesting. Um, I think I think what folks should know if a solar or wind project comes to your community, I think you should you should know that other communities have gone through these permitting processes, and there's ways to ensure that these projects work well for your community. That you're you know that all of the um, financial protections are in place, and that you know your health and safety needs are going to be met and insured, and that the economic benefits are really going to translate to your community. And so, I want folks to feel comfortable to engage in the process and work with their local elected officials. Look at some of the um, joint development agreements that have already been approved in Wisconsin. In the case of Iowa County. It's a local operating contract, and then in Jefferson County, there's a joint development agreement. And those sort of lay out the responsibilities of the developer, the responsibilities of the community to one another. Um, And that helps uh, local folks make sure that that all of their concerns are going to be addressed and that they have some guarantees in place. And I think as long as you... Uh, work through that process carefully and with an open mind, you, you can get a project that really serves the community. And so what I saw last night was um, there were some folks who were nervous that um, they weren't going to be protected, that they didn't have local control over the project, and that um, and that they didn't fully understand how the process was going to work. So if folks have questions, Renew Wisconsin is certainly a resource, but... Um, there's lots of documents now in the Public Service Commission database about um, the details of some of these projects. Mm-hmm. So there's there's data there, and we can provide that. And I just want to assure folks that if they're if they're curious about what this really means for their community, there are answers that can help them do what they need to do to make sure their community is what they want it to be. What do you say to people who have concerns about decommissioning and what to do with the panels after their useful life? Sure. Well, decommissioning, the the developers, in every case I've seen in Wisconsin, the developers um, 
guarantee in their agreement that they will decommission the project and they put up financial security to ensure that, say, the company went out of business, the project would still be decommissioned. And in addition to that, um, especially in the case of solar farms, the equipment is so valuable that it's unlikely that anyone would ever have a problem getting that, getting those steel posts out of the ground and, and getting that equipment um, to another stage of its life. So solar panel recycling is another question. Um, my understanding is that First Solar is recycling. It, it's a um, United States-based solar manufacturer and that they are recycling their panels. Um, and there are European factories that are European recyclers of solar panels that are, are now online. But I think it's still an issue that the industry is going to have to grapple with. There are, there's good 25 year lifespan for all of these panels. So these farms going in probably won't be decommissioned for another two decades or more. But um, I think it is something that we're going to have to look at as a, as a policy mm -hmm. question or as a public health question. How do we want to ensure that these panels are reused properly? There have been studies that prove that it's non-hazardous material. It could be disposed of um, in a, you know, as normal trash is disposed of. But it would be better to be able to reuse those materials on a consistent basis. So I, th I think that's something we need to dig into. So where do you see the solar industry in the next 10 years? I mean, where do you see the mix? I mean, if we're at 1% now, and what's what's a goal? You would probably guess that I would say that uh, the w state of Wisconsin's goal is um, carbon neutral electricity yep. by 2050. And that's our goal at mg e as well. Right. Yeah. And it's an ambitious goal. It really is. Um, I, I know there's folks who, who say that's not fast enough, but to scale up to, to accomplish what that really means will take a lot, a great deal of work. Mm -hmm. um, but where I see the industry heading, I really think, I mean, the technology is changing so fast and so quickly that 10 years from now, I don't really know what a solar panel would look like. You know, there's solar panel window clings now, and there's bifacial solar panels that can absorb um, sunshine from both the top and the bottom of the panel, increasing the efficiency of the panels. You know, there's flexible panels, and 10 years from now, I don't, I honestly don't know what a new solar panel will look like. I think that's the fascinating part. That's so exciting. So tell us, you said you have solar on your rooftop. I do. What played into that decision? And and if you saw something like solar clings or whatever, you know, would you do more? Oh, yeah. I actually want to learn how to play with it more. So I have uh -huh. a little shed, too. Um, and it, it almost looks, the roof of my shed looks like there's a solar panel on it. So I kind of want to put a separate solar panel on it and attach it to a battery and figure out if I can charge my electric lawnmower from it and all these things. Um, so I definitely want to do more and learn more about how to manage it myself. Um, You're all in on this. Yeah, I became really fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating to kind of make your own power. So um, I think my house made me do it. I have a really tiny little house with a perfectly forty-five degree angle roof facing south, with a, you know, and the only trees in front of it are across the street. So. You just look at my roof at any day, day of the week, and it's it's bright. Sunshine's bouncing off of it, and I just you know I knew enough about solar panels to know that that was a really good fit. Um, and then it was the solar panels were my gateway drug into being fascinated in this industry. And so I've had some debates with um, colleagues that a lot of folks feel like from a practical physical perspective, you should do all your energy efficiency stuff first. And then if you still need to generate more electricity or save more power, you could put solar on. Well, what if you put solar on and then you become fascinated by your electricity bill? And then you start um, insulating and you start doing all this extra work that isn't quite as exciting as putting solar panels on. Yeah. And oftentimes it's hidden. So weatherization work, a lot of it, you don't really get to see what you've done. You, you don't get to like see it every day and think about that. Um, what that's doing for for your house or your pocketbook or the planet. So I think that the reverse can also be true, that being in, starting to be interested in renewable energy can take you down the efficiency route and can sort of open up all these doors into energy projects. Do you have thoughts on community solar and exciting developments there? Oh, yeah. Well, I actually did a, 
did a podcast episode with some of your colleagues from mg e about community solar and also with some folks from Excel Energy who work in Minnesota with some of their community solar projects. And they have 625 megawatts of community solar alone in Minnesota. So, wow. yeah, <laughs> which is more, you know, about five times of the total solar we have in the state of Wisconsin. So it's incredible. It's incredible. And um, so community solar done right can really help people scale up because if you're a renter or you just don't have a lot of upfront money or you don't want to take out a loan for solar, community solar is a perfect way to go. And it can be a good economic savings, but also you just don't have to deal with the logistics of putting something on your rooftop and having contractors come out. Um, it's a great option. I know mg es program is great, and a number of Wisconsin utilities are doing it now, too. How do people find out what programs are available to them um, in terms of community solar or if they want to install solar on their rooftop or just know more about what their utility is up to? Well, I Should they contact their utility. Yeah, for for uh, MGE customers, you can just visit our website or give us a call, and um, we have information on our website and on on our shared solar program. And um, I can't speak for the other utilities, but maybe you have some information on. Yeah, I definitely think reaching out to your local utility is a good way to go. Um, I have to put in a plug for Renew Wisconsin. We do a lot to make sure we know about all the programs and opportunities around the state, so we can direct you as well. Um, Sometimes it's, you know, it's your local sustainability committee that's just about to start a new local group by to help people go solar um, at a more affordable price. So it does kind of depend. You might have to shop around a little bit, but um, there is a lot of information out there, a lot of programs. And another, op- another way to um, explore it is to get a free estimate from a local solar installer and, s- and see if it's a good fit for your house. You can also, if you're interested on in solar for your home, you can go on Project Sunroof. Um, which is a, a Google mapping system that shows how much sunlight your rooftop gets and whether that might be, that's a real rough estimate whether you might save money with solar. Interesting. All right, so now we'll ask. Okay. Do you have a bright idea to yeah. share with us? Yeah. All right. Um, I was thinking about this, and my bright idea is like so simple that it's going gonna, it's gonna to seem a little dim, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that... The most important thing right now is get going because these tax credits are going away. So if you are interested in solar for any purpose at all, you want to do it in the next two years to maximize the economic benefit. Like now is the time to do it. So my bright idea is get started. Love it. It's a great idea because mine was very similar. Was it? Yeah. (laughs) Let's go. Let's go now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Thank awesome. you so much for joining us and Thank say you. the that name of fun. say the name of your podcast again. The Wisconsin Energy Broadcast. Okay, great. Everybody go subscribe to that. I know I'm going to because I don't think I've actually subscribed to it yet. Oh yeah, so. please subscribe. You okay. can rate us too. I'd <laughs> love to. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was a blast. Yeah. Well, that was an awesome interview with Heather. I feel like I learned so much from her. She's got a lot to offer on this issue. Um, very informative. Very yeah. informative. I loved hearing about her house and that kind of being her gateway. I was kind of thinking it. my gateway was electric vehicles. And when I got an electric vehicle, then I became interested in learning more about time of use rates and all of that. Yeah, and we, I mean, we haven't gone that far, but... Uh, energy conservation, just knowing when to, you know, um, use your appliances, do your, do your laundry at night, stuff like that, where we have the smart lights and the smart thermostat and, um, it's, but to have a, a, a shed for your solar facilities, like, like Heather is pretty remarkable. That so. is really cool. So our next interview is going to be with Jeff Ripp from Alliant Energy. This is a great interview. Um, I we have both worked with Jeff in the past, or or work with him yep. now um, in various capacities. Jeff is is a great asset over there at Alliant. I loved the update on the solar demonstration project they have at their headquarters. Yeah, and with his company having a large utility scale solar facility. Um, being proposed and my company the same it's uh it's interesting to get his take and hear what he has to say about his his experiences so far so all right next up we've got jeff Ripp.
All right, we are sitting here chatting with Jeff Ripp from Alliant Energy. Jeff, you just told me your title is Director of Regulatory Strategy and Solutions. That's correct. So I'm interested, what does that mean? Tell us more about your role at Alliant Energy. Sure. Well, thanks for having me, first of all. Thank this is you. great to be here, and it's a great opportunity to reconnect with you, and I know we've worked together in the past. Um, so Director of Regulatory Strategy and Solutions for the Utility really means working with our regulators on coming up with ways to serve our customers and meet their needs going forward. So within my role, I work on getting our rates approved that we charge our customers, getting our major projects approved that we need to go through for our regulators. My role specifically, I have responsibility for state jurisdictions, both Wisconsin and Iowa. And uh, from the regulatory component of that, it really is making sure that the commissions and the, and the Iowa, it's the utilities board, understand the changes that we're going through as a company and helping us better serve our customers. Part of my role as well is thinking long-term about resource planning and, and how we're serving those customers with our energy mix. So, Jeff, you said that you are working to help um, get major projects through the regulatory process, and Alliant recently made a major announcement of a major investment in solar. So can you tell us more about that announcement and how you're going to work to get it through the regulatory process? Sure, absolutely. It's a very exciting time in the energy industry and particularly in utilities. Um, I think the changes we're seeing happen across the country here in Wisconsin and in Iowa, we're not immune to those changes. The economics of renewable energy is really driving a lot of the decision-making for the utility. Um, that and a, and a heightened awareness of the importance of sustainability and sustainability for our own company and making sure that we're making the right choices um, to serve the customers going forward, but also helping our customers meet their own sustainability goals. Increasingly, what you see are major companies listed on the stock exchanges that are out there joining carbon pledges or joining renewable goals. And those companies are located in our service territory here in the state. And so we do think that in order to serve them better, we need to actually provide that product that they're looking for as well. So with our announcement, I mean, we're very excited. We're calling it Powering What's Next, and it's part of our larger uh, blueprint of how we're going to make investments to serve the state of Wisconsin. And Alliant did recently announce that we want to install 1,000 megawatts of solar by 2023 here in Wisconsin to serve our customers. Which 2023, is 2023, that's actually sooner than I was thinking. Yeah, it's a very ambitious goal, but wow. we can do it. How are you going to do it? So right now, as you look across the range of options to serve customers, certainly we have investments in plants that have been operating very well, serving our customers economically for many years. Uh, the cost to run those more traditional resources, whether it's you know coal plants or, or um, not so much in Wisconsin, but nuclear plants, uh, the cost of renewables is just way more competitive today. And as we're looking out 5, 10, 15, 20 years, there's a number of investments you have to make to keep those resources running for the long term. And they take fuel and they use water. All the renewables, whether it's wind or solar, once you put them in the ground, the energy is essentially free to run those and, and generate electricity. And so in the long term, this is going to be a much more cost effective way to serve customers. As we look across the state of Wisconsin today, there's approximately five or five and a half gigawatts. It's a lot of projects that d developers are working on. So there's a lot of opportunity right now, I think, to move on some very good projects that will benefit our customers. Do you hear from your customers a lot on this? Uh, we, we overlap a little bit in Dane County, not overlap, but we both share customers in Dane County. And um, outside of Dane County, what are they saying about solar and renewables? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's not just a Dane County phenomenon. This is a economic phenomenon for many of our customers. They all want, uh, obviously, affordable, safe, reliable power looking out into the future. The, the, what we hear back from our customers is they, they care about the environment too. And so for even our residential customers, our small businesses that may not have those large, um, you know, very ambitious goals on sustainability, 
they are also interested in renewables because they see that long term there's lower fuel costs, mm -hmm. better economics to those projects. And you're seeing it with customers who are willing to put their own generation on their house as well. So you're seeing how customers are looking to become more sustainable. And that's great. I mean, some customers are going to want to move faster than we can move as a utility. And we want to be able to support them in, in those goals as well. So how, how do you work with your customers who want to generate their own solar power or any other renewable sure. generation? Similar to other utilities in the state, we work with them on the interconnection process. And primarily that is to make sure that the systems they're putting on their facilities or on their buildings are safe, you know, are operated efficient, you know, safely and efficiently. Um, and then there's rules for how we connect to them. And we, we're there to provide technical assistance and help them with that interconnection process. We have other alternatives, though, for customers that maybe want to move a little bit faster, but either they can't put it on their roof, maybe they're in an area that has a lot of trees, or maybe their building's not oriented correctly. You know, looking at programs like community solar, and we're announcing some community solar. You know, we're looking at sites around our service territory. Um, we have a, a program to help with some large, smaller industrial commercial customers who want to have solar located on site where the utility can own that for them, for their benefit as well, and they would benefit from the renewable energy uh, generated off that. And then looking at those larger projects too, of how do we bring in, for those customers that need bigger amounts of energy, how can we provide renewable energy to them? And then our more traditional programs like our Second Nature program, where as a residential customer, you just choose that you wanna have a certain percentage of your customer come from renewables. And those dollars then help us make those investments to continue to bring our renewables online. I feel like technology is advancing so quickly. It's kind of hard to stay on the cutting edge of this this phenomenon. Um, and I, I think that projects like, you know, um, the renewable energy right that we have, I'm not sure what you guys call it, but providing renewable energy to, to these smaller industrial customers um, is becoming more and more popular. Um, how do you work with the regulators on issues like that? It's a good question. I think... The regulators are there, obviously, to regulate, right? To make sure that we are not disadvantaging any one customer. And the world's changing. It's different than it used to be where we'd build a central station power plant and everybody paid the same price as you distributed that. I think we're recognizing the difference needs of the different customers. I think the commission's recognizing that as well. If you look here in Wisconsin especially, I think the commission has recognized the need for some flexibility in how we continue to serve customers within that traditional framework that we're regulated in. Um, and we've really been appreciative at, at Alliant for that being in, that partnership we have with the Wisconsin Commission to try new things and, and move some products forward. But you're right, the technology is changing. I think if you look back, even for the utility scale solar installations, mm -hmm. costs are 90% what they were 10 years ago. The productivity of the solar panels themselves are way up. Um, what, how we move power around on the distribution system is changing. The investments we're making in automation there have enabled us to connect solar at the distribution level, whether it's customer owned or utility owned, and serve our customers in new ways that 20 years ago yeah. people weren't thinking about. And the next is batteries. Like As that technology starts to improve and those costs get better, certainly we're going to see a lot more applications for batteries, not just for generation supplying power mm -hmm. but for ma managing and maintaining our distribution system at you know safe operating voltages and frequency regulation and all those things the more technical technical things that you need to do on the distribution system so jeff i left alliant energy about two months before you got there right um so when when I was there, they were just starting a solar demonstration project. I thought it was really cool out in um, the parking lot area of Alliant Energy. And they also set up a bunch of um, EV charging infrastructure. Um, my question for you is, how is that doing? I know that was a project with the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI. Um, are there any results? I know this demonstration project was designed to um, sort of gather information about how solar works in the Midwest. So is there any information you can share with us now a couple of years later? Yeah, absolutely. That project's still there. It's still up and running and still collecting data. And we've learned a lot. That uh, project is at our headquarters over on the east side of Madison. 
and it's open to the public. We have uh, a walking path that people can walk through and see. There's several different configurations of solar panels. Some of them are oriented exactly where you'd want them to be. Some of them are oriented in different directions just to be able to tell what the different types of product productivity you'd get from that, how they perform in snow, how they perform in, you know, in the climate we have here in Wisconsin. Um, but it's been great. It really has uh, demonstrated to us the value of solar and how we can use that to help serve our customers. So we've been asking everyone that comes on the show, uh, if you have one bright idea for Wisconsin, um, king for a day, what would it be? That's a great question. I'm unlimited to just one though, right? Yeah, I had one. Kristen had one. All right, uh, I can so do you one. Get one. I can do one. Um, I think the importance of connecting the work that we do at Align Energy and our utilities with our communities, finding a way to make sure that the communities are served to meet their needs. Each community is going to be a little bit different. Um, making sure that the work we're doing is meeting those specific needs of those communities, whether it's helping out with their streetlights, helping them with electrification of their transportation infrastructure, and just generally serving the customers and helping them grow and strengthen their communities. That's a big one for us. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity. Our final interview today is going to be with Representative Mike Kuglich, who is the chairman of the Energy and Utilities Committee. This was a really good interview, too. He's got a lot of passion in this issue. Um, sometimes um, legislators will pick up an issue and he and you know take it to heart and i feel like he's he's done that with uh, the utilities and you know energy overall in wisconsin you really can feel that come through in the interview it was also cool getting the two of you back together yeah i worked for mike for about six years up until 2016 so getting to interview him was was fun it was really cool all right stay tuned for our interview with representative kuglich So we have with us today Representative Mike Kuglich, who is a Republican from New Berlin. He is the chairman of the Assembly Energy and Utilities Committee. He's been the chairman for seven years now. Um, he was first elected in 2010. And we're so delighted to have you here today. Thank you for joining us, Representative. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to, to sit down with you and also Matt Spencer, who worked in my office for many years. So let's talk about some legislation that's moving through right now. Um, there is a bill, Assembly Bill 237, relating to the reimbursement grants for employers for payment of costs for certification programs in solar and wind energy systems. I wanted to get that whole thing in there so we didn't miss any of it. So this is essentially a solar and wind workforce training bill, um, and you are the author. So tell us a little bit about why you introduced this legislation and why you think it's important. Well, it kind of goes back to when I first ran in 2010. Uh, we were looking at double digit unemployment in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so in, in working with Matt, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to change was job training and workforce development. Um, so that has always been something that has been important to me. Um, is to help create jobs. Government doesn't create jobs, but government can help set the, the stage for job creation. And that was kind of the genesis of, of AB 237. I was, uh, again, reading and I came across the Department of Labor uh, Statistics report last year that showed that wind installer, or I'm sorry, solar installers and wind technicians is the fastest growing profession or, or job in the country. And then looking at what's in the queue for MISO in MISO and what the PSC has on their dockets, you look at how much wind and especially solar that is proposed in the state of Wisconsin in the next, you know, three to five years, it wasn't it wasn't hard to connect the dots that said let's be proactive. Let's use a very successful program called Fast Forward, and let's get um, citizens of Wisconsin trained 
in these two professions that we know are growing across the country. And when you couple that with the amount that is proposed of solar and wind, um, I want our citizens in the state to have those jobs because if not, the alternative, uh, the alternative is that these installers are gonna bring people from outside the state that are already trained. All right, so yeah. let's, let's talk about the PSC bill that's moving through the legislative process right now. You have a history of helping secure consumer advocate funding and AB 712 does just that. So can you talk a little bit more about your involvement in getting this legislation drafted and through the process? So, so we talked earlier about when Matt and I first came in um, as, as kind of the energy utility, um, it was the first PSC bill just was being drafted. So we're kind of learning the ropes and, uh, and you know, kind of cutting our teeth on the first PSC utility omnibus bill, I'll call it. Um, and now we just um, passed the assembly exec uh, 16.0 on our fourth bill. So it's been very successful um, where we can get the PSC, the Public Service Commission at the table. We get the, the stakeholders, the utilities, and then um, myself and the chairman from the Senate um, Energy Utility Committee. And we can look at how we can make the regulatory system more efficient. Um, and then we also look at what are some things that we can do in policy changes um, that need to be done. And this year, one uh, of the, I think, additions to uh, the traditional type bills we've done is it has to do with um, creating a sustainable and uh, stable funding model, funding source for the Citizen Utility Board. Representative Kuglic, can you kind of talk about how we got to this point with the Citizens Utility Board? I, I know there's, there's, there's an allocation of funds there um, and why, that's in, why that is important to the regulatory model. So uh, um, the Public Service Commission uh, Chairwoman Balk did an excellent job in our committee in explaining the importance of intervener groups. And uh, CUB is uh, an intervener group. Um, and what they do is the utilities will come in with their recommendations on a rate increase. And then you'll have what's called an intervener. Um, and CUB is a citizen utility um, board which, which supports residential and small business um, groups, whereas there are environmental interveners as well um, and large, um, large corporation interveners as, as part of the process. So with CUB, the importance to create some additional funding came from two different ways. Number one is in our last PSC bill, we introduced settlements where when the utilities come together, um, come in front of the PSC, um, a lot of the work is done ahead of time in a settlement and CUB needs to hire in-house expertise. So when they come to the settlement, they're able to have that expertise there and not wait for a rate case. And I'll just note that the Citizens Utility Board is a member of the Customers First Coalition and the Customers First Coalition is a proud supporter of Assembly Bill 712. Yeah. And, and outside of Customers First, Mass and Gas and Electric, and all the other large um, investor-owned utilities in Wisconsin um, support consumer funding and the PSC omnibus bill that's being discussed right now as well. And I think the reason for that is is sort of balancing the process as you go through the regulatory process, making sure all voices are heard so you have a more robust record um, for the PSC to make decisions on. So with that said, I think I'll transition to our next question here, which is what role do you think consumer advocates will play as utilities transition their generation portfolios to include more wind and solar power? 
I think I kind of look at through the lens I talked earlier about safe, reliable, and affordable energy. So I think that consumer advocates like Cub is going to be important because when we make that transition to more solar and wind, that the consumer advocate will be looking out for the retired couple at the end of the street or, or grandma or the small shops on Main Street that, you know, can't represent themselves. And, and I, I think they'll even the playing field through this transition because they'll be looking out for what the costs are. So I, I think it's very important because as we go through the transition, I, you know, I, we're obviously going to be closing existing uh, power plants and, and building new generation um, that are going to be either zero CO2 or reduce CO2 as we go through that transition. And, and I think it's important, or I believe it's important, that we have someone looking out for the consumer. You know, we talked about these past, the, the, the PS, um, PSC omnibus bill with the consumer advocacy funding and this jobs training bill. And I found that energy policy doesn't always have to be a, a partisan issue. As, uh, as a state assemblyman, do you, are there any, have you found any bipartisan agreements um, when talking with your colleagues on energy policy? Well, I think when you look at the, the jobs bill, right, that you could say directly benefits solar and wind. However, it's a jobs bill. It's going to benefit the citizens of, of Wisconsin that want to get into those professions and, and offer training. So I think sometimes we lose sight of the, the big picture mm -hmm. and, and focus on, on some of the specifics. I think another example is one of my colleagues, uh, Representative Adam Nealon, earlier this year had a proposal um, for electric vehicle charging stations um, and creating a corridor throughout the state of Wisconsin so that our neighbors to the south or to the west can feel confident and, and drive on our interstates and highways with having you know, electric vehicle charging stations. I think that is one that both sides understand that that's the direction we're going in. And, and the beauty of it is, is that it didn't cost the state any or taxpayers any money because it was using the Volkswagen settlement uh, uh, money. All right, last question here. Tell us about a bright idea that you have in the energy space. So we've been asking, uh, we've been asking people that, that come on the podcast. I got to ask you as well. Chris an answered the question. So, if you were king for the day, or since this is an energy pod podcast, if you had all the power, what would you, what would you, what would you do with it? I love that. If you had all the power, I think we may need to go with that from now on. Well, that's kind of shocking. Oh, oh but um, there, that was there good. we go. That was good. So if, if I had, uh, if I was king for the day or had all the power and, and I could wave my magic wand in the energy sector, what would it be? I, I think I would look at reliability. When we looked at the kind of the mantra of safe, reliable, and affordable. So I, I would look at reliability and then I'd look at innovation. Um, if you look at the history of our country, it, it's been driven on innovation. And I think if you look at what solar and wind have done over the last decade, um, they've become more efficient. Um, the costs have dropped by 88%. So we're going in the right direction, innovation there. Now, but when you look at the reliability part, as we all know that it's not always sunny and it's not always windy. So we need innovation to step in. And we've been hearing about battery backup and storage for years. Um, so we need to make sure that we continue down that road and that we develop efficient and cost-effective battery storage so then we can make sure that we, we touch on that affordability piece. The second part is we have coal and we have natural gas now. And I think if we're talking about innovation, if I could wave my magic wand, I would like to see as much time, dollars, and resources that we spend on battery storage and we look at carbon capture. 
And if we can if we can capture the carbon that is released from coal and uh, natural gas, then we're accomplishing, I think, what everybody wants, and that is um, energy generation with low or zero CO2 emission. So if I was king for the day, I think that would be it, is that we would concentrate innovation on not only um, a certain segment of how the electron is made on a, that particular type of, of generation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Representative Kuglich. I, if, if I get a chance to, to see your smiling face and my, my old uh, staff, Matt Spencer, I'll do it any day. It is crazy how much the utility world has changed in terms of innovation since I worked for you in 2015. Just to see how much technology has moved the needle. Um, over the past decade, for yeah. sure, since you first came into office. It's and I think that that's the positive that we all have, is that innovation is going to drive this sector in the future. With that, thank you again for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, and there you have it. That was our first podcast of The Electric Wire. Remember to search for The Electric Wire wherever you subscribe to podcasts and subscribe, download, share, tell your friends. We really appreciate you getting the word out about The Electric Wire and our energy innovation series here. Thank you to all of our guests, Heather, Jeff, and Representative Kuglich. Thank you to my co-host, Matt Spencer. Very happy to be here. This was really fun. And we will be back in two weeks with our next podcast. This will be centered on electric vehicles, electric vehicle policies. We have a really great group for this discussion. Uh, Jane McCurry, some of you know her as E.B. Jane from Renew Wisconsin, will be my co-host. Really excited about that one. And send us your ideas. If you have an idea for, for future interviews, let me know. You can email cfc at customersfirst.org or send us a message on Facebook or Twitter. You should also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to see that. We're going to be tweeting out updates about the podcast as we go through here. And lastly, I want to say a special thank you to the members of the Customers First Coalition for sponsoring this podcast.